Hello everyone. Let's take a look at our player, shall we? This player has a few very limited expectations of it, which is always where you want to start with something like this. We have an animation going, so there are multiple animations here, uh, such as being stunned, which is your basic rotation. I decided to keep that. Standing and walking down, which are actually identical, but feel free to replace them with something else. They're, they are not semantically identical, though. Walking left, walking right, and walking up. And, of course, a reset for when some keyframe gets out of hand. It shouldn't here. And this is all controlled via an animation tree, which I will show you here. Animation trees take an animation player and apply rules as to which animation they should be doing, and blending rules. Uh, here I have one one-shot for when the player is stunned, and a number of blends for walking up, down, left, and right. Moreover, I have violated one of my traditional tendencies here, though not a rule, and given it its own script simply to keep these two semantically separated, as this script is purely worried about animation trees business. We also have a multiplayer synchronizer here, and once again, in line with my own rules, I'm synchronizing as little as possible. And there is a mistake here I'm already seeing. Label text is the player name here. That should likely be on change, not always. I may fix that in a future update to the project. Player position is what we're going for with player movement. As a general rule, I'm sure there are exceptions to this. It's best to have one engine, hope usually your server, handle all of the physics, and everybody else will take end properties like position and rotation and synchronize on them. Otherwise, there's a possibility of things falling out of sync. Not always a huge deal, but it can be an issue. Um, moreover, it, it blows CPU cycles, but we've all got plenty of those, so I doubt that's going to manifest. Player itself is a character body 2D. It's a type of uh, collider effectively. I shouldn't say collider, it's a physics body. Um, and these, in order to function properly, have to have a collision shape attached to them. In this instance, I've gone with a basic circle shape 2D, but there are many other possibilities. Uh, the equivalent exists in 3D, of course. And lastly, we have our sprite here, which is just a sprite 2D. However, it is animated and using a sprite sheet texture here with a specific division of H frames and V frames for each way. This allows you to fit an entire animation onto a single texture. So let's look at our player first. I've called this new player because I wanted to keep it synchronized with the old player in behavior, so I wanted to have them both around. Initially I was just poking at the old player, but a lot of it I ended up wanting to rewrite and finally decided it would be a great exercise to just write my own. So we give it a class name here as new player, extending character body 2D, as it is a character body 2D. I've exported one variable here called stunned, which is a boolean set to false initially. <coughs> Speed is set to a constant. I've upped it to 300, which is about twice what it was before. Just for my own comfort, feel free to do what you will with it. Uh, that's going to be the rate that we will be translating across the screen when we're moving. We also have an RPC call here. This is an important one. It can be called by anybody and it is callable locally. Uh, you might be able to tighten that up a little. But what it basically does is set the multiplayer authority. This has to be done on the multiplayer, well, on the script itself, effectively. You can't really call it as effectively from outside without dressing it up a little for the network. So basically, set authority is RPC with a pure ID and everybody who gets it sets the multiplayer authority on this to that peer ID. It is possible to fall out of sync on that. I can't think of any time when someone would want that to happen. So that's an important thing to remember. 
Physics process, as many of you I'm sure know, is called every update frame, not necessarily every graphical frame. Those fall out of sequence very quickly. And it takes one parameter, which is the delta time since the last one, which should be close to constant, but not quite. Sometimes things will get in the way. We're not using it here, though. First thing it does is check to make sure that it is the multiplayer authority. You will remember we set that in set authority when we spawned this thing. So it's making sure that we are actually the peer that has charge over this player and nobody else. First step is to get the input direction and handle the movement. First thing we'll check is whether we're stunned. How does one get stunned? In the gameplay, it's being too close to a bomb going off effectively. And that pauses you for a moment. Not a terrible problem, but it's good to see how that kind of thing can interact on the network and remain in sync. So if this is the case, we're not going to bother with any of this until stunned is no longer true. If we're not stunned, then we use a function called input.getVector. This gives us a vector between move left and move right being down, and also move up and move down, as I have it here. That will give us a vector 2. Um, these are basically... Um, I guess you call them action names. I'm not entirely sure what Godot calls them. You do them in uh, project settings under input mapping. So in this case, it's W, S, and A and D. Now, if direction is a shorthand here, it simply checks to see whether it's vector 2.0. If it's not, then we set our velocity to that direction times our speed. Otherwise, we slow it down towards 0 at speed. That's so we come to a slow stop instead of a sudden stop. It honestly feels a little frivolous for a tutorial here, but I left it in. I like how it looks. That's going to handle our velocity down at the bottom when we call move and slide. That means move, and if you hit an obstruction, slide along it, based on velocity. But we're not entirely done. We also need to handle bombs. If our action is pressed for set bomb, which is another input map, we call drop bomb with the RPC ID of 1, because we want to call them the host, and data being an array with the position and the peer ID of this player. One thing I'd like to highlight about peer IDs is I commonly see people um, naming nodes after the peer ID. And there are a lot of issues that, that I take with that. Um, to begin with, the name of a node is, um, I, for, I forgot exactly what they call it. It's not actually a string. It's something meant to be more quickly comparable than that. So if you want to look at it again, you have to convert it to a string, and then from that string you have to convert it to an integer, and this is a whole freeway of flaming hoops to ask your game to go through every single frame. If you actually do need the peer ID, sort it in an int and put it on the synchronizer. And beyond that, you usually don't need it because you can use get unique ID and is multiplayer authority to do the same thing. So I basically weeded peer ID out of here. I don't remember, honestly, if the player nodes are still named after their peer ID, but the point is they've got to be arbitrary. They don't have to be the peer ID, and you should never, in an update function, consistently convert a, a um, string to an integer, let alone the specialized string that Godot uses. I want to say it's string name or something like that. So here we're just using get unique ID and is multiplayer authority. For drop bomb, again, any peer and call local. I admit I was a little lazy with that, but uh, I'm not that concerned at the moment. Uh, in the future, perhaps I will touch up on it. What that does is it gets our bomb spawner. And I don't believe I've gone over spawners yet, but basically... They are something which synchronizes producing a node over the network and calls that spawner spawn function with that data, which I remind you is the position and the peer ID that dropped the bomb for the sake of keeping track of score. We're going to come back to this in the next video, or a future video at least, spawners. 
how they differ from synchronizers. Set player name is just for the label text. Um, this function bugs me a little, but I think it's acceptable. It simply sets the label text to that value. Now, it's capable of being RPC'd if it needs to, but I doubt that it will at this point. The next RPC is teleport. I described this in a previous lecture, but the whole idea with teleport is to make sure that the correct peer is changing the position. You'll remember that the synchronizer is synchronizing that position, so it's true the same for everybody, or at least very close together. But if we end up setting, uh, just saying um, position equals new position, and we're on the wrong peer when this happens, and then it synchronizes again, it will be immediately overwritten. So teleport is designed to set that position on the correct peer, and then it lets the synchronizer do the rest, so everybody updates. Lastly, we have exploded. If we're already stunned, ignore it. Otherwise, set stunned equal to true, and then await the finishing of the current animation. The moment stunned becomes true, it's going to jump in our animation tree to this guy, the one shot. When that one shot is finished, that's going to fire a signal. That signal will be animation finished. So it will be stunned until the animation finishes and then stunned equals false. So you can think of this kind of like a coroutine in Unity in many ways. Um, it would also be possible to simply wait for the amount of time of stunned, but I don't know that we're never going to want to change that. It may be a different amount of time eventually. Yeah, okay. Now, I mentioned that there was a second script here. Animation tree. This has a very specific job. It simply controls these blends within the animation tree itself. This called for a script on animation tree because, for one, uh, it immediately has access to it. It won't have to go hunting for it. And two, all of this functionality relates exclusively to what the animation tree is doing. It is not strictly necessary for player. But we do keep track of the player, just in case I decide to reorganize the tree at some point. I want to keep track of that. We also keep tr uh, track of a couple of change variables. Last position, which is the last position it was at, and the last stunned status. This is important for logic in a moment. During process, which is like physics process, but gets called every graphics frame, we calculate the motion of the player. Rather than using the velocity, we use its global position minus its last global position. Uh, so regardless of what ends up moving it, the animation should be correct here. And I remind you, this is just for the animation. Last position is set to the current global position after that, so we can update it in the next frame. Then we use self.set. For animation tree, what set does is it changes the parameters of the actual tree. In this case, we've got up, down, left, right, and stunned. You'll note my labels there. They're meant to be descriptive. And each of these are set to a dot uh, 1.0 if the dot product with their corresponding direction is greater than zero, meaning it's facing that direction at all, otherwise 0, 0.0. So one, well, it's not one, but one or zero. One means it entirely kicks in with the blend animation. Zero means it totally ignores it. I don't think we want it to blend here, though we could in a 3D game because in a case like that, it would end up uh, jumping between the frames in a really odd way. The last one, though, is if we weren't stunned a moment ago, if not last stunned, and stunned now, so if we just got stunned, this is important for a one-shot, then it sets parameters stunned request to one-shot request fire. That's how you fire one of them from code. After that, 
regardless, we set last stunned to the current status of stunned. So, if I jump back over here, and I turn this thing on, can I turn you on? There we go. That's going to be our stunned animation. I had to think twice before adding the animation tree because I didn't want to end up overcomplicating the code, but truthfully, I think we are doing just fine with this. I think it's simplified it more than anything. To give you an example of the others, suppose we want to be walking up instead of down. I would set this blend to 1.0. Now we're walking up, but if we go with, say, 0.2, then I'm going to get all kinds of flickering because it's not really how this is designed. If it was an armature animation, it might be quite different. Then that might be ideal. We've also got walk left, walk right. Y'all get the idea. Label is simply no so we know them apart. It's set to player one by default, but in a previous file that I've gone over, I showed you where it was set to the actual player name. 